Hi, my name's Samuel Finlay, and you're listening to the Aces Podcast. In this episode, I chat with Aces and Deakin University Research Fellow, Dr. Cristina Pozo Gonzalo. We spoke about her background, moving from Spain to Manchester and then Australia, her career in research, and much more. So let's get to our conversation. So I'm chatting with Christina on the podcast today. Christina, thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you for having me. How are you doing? How's life during COVID-19? Well, <laughs> it's a bit tough, I have to say. Uh, trying to keep busy. It's good that we can still work uh, from home, so we are busy most of the time and just trying to go for walks and um, maybe doing something additional, you know, reading books and things like that to keep sane, I guess. And you're at Deakin University. Have you been going in at the moment or are you at home full time? Yes, yeah, at home and at home uh, full time. So we are no, we are still not allowed to go into the offices. So we're waiting, waiting for changes. So, so we'll get into your current role in a moment, but let's first go back to the beginning, I guess, and we'll start with your PhD experience. I believe you did that at the University of Manchester. Can you explain what you did for that? So I was I did my honours uh, in Spain in the Central University where I did my degree, and they had some connections with them, um, uh, with where there was my supervisor during the PhD, and they asked me if I wanted to go there. And for me, always I, I wanted to go overseas since, uh, for so many years. So that was like a great opportunity to do the PhD and also going overseas. So that's why I decided to, yeah, to go to Manchester. So what was your PhD focused on? So my PhD was focused on conducting polymers. Uh, and uh, it was about synthesis of uh, new conducting polymers and synthesized by electrochemical means. So some of these uh, polymers, they were used for different applications, so for example, like electrochromic uh, devices. So that means that the, um, these polymers, they could change color uh, when they change the potential. So it has a wide range of applications as well. So yeah, that was my... Right, and you mentioned Spain just before. That's where you're originally from, right? Yeah, yeah, from Zaragoza. So that's a city that is between Madrid and Barcelona, halfway between both big cities. And yes, I already did my degree in chemistry. Yeah. Right. And were you always interested in science growing up? Is that something you always wanted to do after you finished school and at university? Well, I, I guess when I had to decide, I always wanted to do science. So that was for sure. And I guess uh, more in the creative science and curious mind, I guess. So that's why I think most of the people maybe do science. Um, and, but when I finished, it was a complicated time. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So it was between uh, chemistry and math, to be honest. But then I, I decided to do chemistry. I think I, we have some tools in the in a school. And I thought that was um, like a nice uh, uh, area to focus. So, yeah. So moving from Spain to Manchester, how was that transition? Oh, it was tough. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> it was also the the first time I was living home so living by myself in a foreign country with another language uh, so it was it was really really hard but uh, I guess you learn from the experience uh, become a different person as well I guess stronger so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so what year did you finish your PhD which year yeah uh, 2002. Okay. And then after finishing your PhD, did you jump straight into uh, work and further research? No, I took a bit of a uh, time off. Uh, I went back to Spain. So by that time, I already met with, you, with this, my husband now. So we back together to, to Spain. So he was uh, working at the university and I was then taking some time off. And then uh, we started looking I guess after a while, starting looking for a, a new position uh, in Spain. And yeah, that's what I, that's what I did to find uh, another job. So that was in a research center. Also in Spain, that was in San Sebastian. And um, so I was there for seven years doing more, I guess, more research, uh, more applied research, working more with industry in, in general. 
what were some of the projects you worked on throughout that time? Well, they were very diverse. So I use uh, some of my skills during my PhD. So I work a lot with conducting polymers. Uh, I did loads on uh, electrochromic uh, devices but also in other electric optic uh, devices with collaboration, like for example on solar cells. Uh, I, work, I did very fundamental research as well on uh, different monomers. Uh, I work on thermochromic materials as well, that was with industry partners. So I did yeah, a, a wide range of variety so of, of projects. So I guess um, what you learn during your PhD is that you can be very flexible and then you can apply your skills to other areas. So then you moved to Australia and Monash in 2011. How did that move come about? Well, so I guess it was, um, I wanted to change a bit. Uh, so I already did the more applied research. And so I wanted to do something different. And that was the time that, uh, remember, it was the economic crisis started. Mm-hmm. Uh, very strongly, especially in Spain. So we decided maybe to come to Australia, it seemed like a better choice. Um, and that's what we did, we moved to Australia. Um, and then, yes, I started working with uh, Professor Alan Bond uh, in Monash just for a few for a few months. But that, that was really good, a really good experience. And while I was there, because it was a short period of time when it was available, I, I contacted also uh, Professor Maria Forsyth. And it was a... Uh, it was really good that they have some uh, projects going on. So I started working with, uh, with Maria, Maria's group. Right. So you moved from Monash to Deakin? Yes. Yes. And so how you've been with Deakin for a while now. How long exactly? Uh, oof, from 2012, I think. Yeah. So many years now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess it's become your home now. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a, a senior research fellow at Deakin at the moment. Yeah. What does that entail? Uh, well, a lot of different um, work, different type of work, I guess. So it comes from supervising and mentoring uh, young researchers, PhD students, uh, I guess, um, as well as uh, securing funding. So uh, working with uh, maybe industry and also more fundamental uh, projects writing projects, um, papers, obviously, going to conferences, making contacts, a lot of, a wide range of, uh, of uh, responsibilities. So you mentioned there, I guess, looking after PhD students. How, how have you found that? I mean, going from someone who studied a PhD to you know, now mentoring uh, PhD students currently, how was that and how has it been? Well, it is a, it's a learning process, I think, uh, because especially every PhD student is different, and that's what you learn over time. So um, you need to know your students, uh, you know, you, to know their weakness and their strengths, and uh, try to encourage them, I guess. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, work with them, so I think um, I work closely with them. We are in the same space, we're in the same office, so it's easy to see them every day and getting in contact with them. So, but this is still a learning process. I, every, as I say, every student is different, so there is no like a magic, um, magic direction to follow, and everything works. So you need to know them as well. So, yeah. So you also have been a part of the communications committee within ACES. Mm-hmm. Yep. How have you found that? Well, I normally like all of these uh, all, all uh, extra or additional activities. I give you a different range of soft skills. So I think it's important, in general, it's important that uh, the whole community knows about what we do at ACES because there are so much interesting research uh, going on. And um, I think it's, yes, it's, it's different, different, um, um, approach i guess and but i i really enjoy it uh, it's just that uh, i guess you always do so many different things and some things you can follow more or speaking of communications you're also on twitter and as many yeah. researchers are these days it's become you know quite a important aspect of of your job how have you fi- found uh i guess engaging in the uh twitter and online community as a researcher I, I have to say I really like it. I think it's a platform 
platform for other researchers to know about your research and to learn from other researchers as well. So because uh, it's very, so what you can write on Twitter is really short. So it's very, with going through the page, the Twitter web page, you can learn so much. And there is so many other researchers as well. I find uh, other researchers that communicate what they find. It's not about their own research, it's about the community. Uh, so I found that very, um, really good in that regard. And also, you strengthen the collaborations as well. So it's not only about sometimes about research, it's about personal experience. So especially now that people are struggling quite a lot with the isolation, I guess. So how everybody's doing and then you feel that you are not alone in the same situation. So I really, I really enjoy. So yeah, I like it. Yeah, great. I know you've been on Twitter posting uh, your life in pictures for the, the last week or so. <laughs> How's that been? Uh, well, it was challenging because being in, in isolation is it's not so much you can post about. <laughs> so I think uh, just being uh, yeah, thinking outside the box, it's like, okay, this is a nice picture to post with uh, or to share with people. So people know what you are doing as well, no? Every day. So, yeah. <laughs> So I guess, you know, speaking of Twitter and, you know, that becoming something that researchers are using today and has been, you know, now an important platform. How, how have you found, I guess, from your, I guess, your start in research to now, how have you found that, you know, it, it's obviously changed so much. How have you found that change and adapting to it? You mean to, to, to adapt into social media? Yeah, and just, I guess, the, the research, the, the way research is done now with this online sort of world. Well, I think, it's a, I think it's a good way. So especially if you can maybe not attend to certain conferences or you cannot travel. So you can always see from other researchers what's going on, who has been in the conferences, maybe yeah. a little bit of the topics they are talking about. So I think um, I think it's yeah I think it's a good idea yeah. So now just a little bit um, I guess on your life outside of work, what what do you do on your days off and your downtime to get away from research? Well, um, I guess we like to be outdoors a lot, which is a bit difficult at the moment. But <laughs> uh, we like we like to travel. We like to travel a lot and uh, going. Uh, especially overseas, uh, go to other countries, uh, learn about other cultures. And here in Australia, we, uh, we try to go maybe to the countryside, so wineries, things like that. They are, uh, I guess, outdoors, in, in general, outdoor experience. Um, um, yeah. So uh, some, something I've been asking everyone that I've had on the podcast so far, and I'm interested to hear, if this applies to you, but do you have maybe a morning routine or something that you do every day that helps you approach a day's work? Oof, um, I don't think so. I just, um, I don't know. I guess I, maybe one of the things I try to do is the day before to be organized mm -hmm. by the day, by the next day. So uh, just to know which meetings I'm going to have and uh, what I want to achieve on the, on the next day so I can prepare. I go to work and I'm prepared for the, for the day. And I guess during work, it's important to have a bit of break from time to time, a bit of social break. So you can maybe go for coffee, I don't know, uh, with some of your colleagues and, you know, talk about life and, so I think that's a, a good approach as well, or going for a little walk. Sometimes uh, you are in front of the computer and you cannot move forward. So go for a little walk, things like that, yeah. Yeah, coffee's definitely be one of the things that everyone's mentioned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's important, it's crucial. <laughs> yes, it is, it is. <laughs> so I guess if you weren't doing research and you, you didn't decide to study science, what do you think you'd be doing for a living? Mm. It's an interesting question. Um, I think something creative. I like, I, I realize what I like about research a lot is about um, making sense of the, of the experiments that we have. So I guess something on that line, you know, like uh, how to connect different pieces to come with a story. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a job for that, but uh, I think it has to be something on the creative side. That's for, that's for sure. 
But um, I don't know. I have. I. I, I guess I asked myself the same question so many times, and to be honest, I'm not sure what I be doing. So um, I guess even within science, there is so many different things that you can do. It doesn't have to be research only. So you so definitely made the right decision then. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. I so. <laughs> so I wonder if you've maybe got any advice to you know someone who's just starting out in research or maybe a PhD student who's currently working hard on their their research project. So um, I think there are different different things to consider. So we all know that research is hard. Okay, so I think that, let's just put it there. But uh, I think you need to be very passionate about what you're doing and also being very curious. So, I mean, like uh, asking questions all the time, like why, uh, why this experiment is giving me this result, result and uh, try to understand exactly um, what is happening. So I think a curious mind is really, really important. And also like uh, there, is, uh, there is times when nothing works. I think we all have gone through that. But um, I think an experiment that is not working is still a result, you know, like, Something that you think it will be working is not working. Why is the reason for that? So I think it's, it's that. And uh, don't get frustrated. So to do something different uh, or go through some, another research for that moment. Or, so um, I think these are the, the main things. And, and work hard, I guess. So work hard, but work efficiently. So I think it's not about working a lot of hours. It's about getting the most of your research and your time during the research. Some great advice there. And just to finish up and to bring the podcast to a bit of an end, I guess, is, is there anything you're you know, looking forward to work on maybe when COVID-19 finishes? Is there any projects that you've got on the horizon that uh, would be worth mentioning? Uh, well, yes. I mean, we started uh, for the last year or so uh, working on what is the circular economy uh, model. So it's just about uh, getting materials and resources uh, in life as long as, long as possible. So we are working on energy storage, as you probably know. And so we want to give these batteries a second life, prolonging the lifetime of these batteries, but also recover some of the key materials uh, or expensive materials that they are in the battery by for different applications and also through different methods. Always, always thinking from a sustainable uh, approach. So that's something that we are currently working. So we have done quite a lot of research, especially on neodymium, that is a rare air metal. It's very scarce uh, at the moment, um, so it's a critical raw material. But we are expanding on other me metals that they are present on lithium-ion batteries, for example. So there is a, so that's something that it will be starting soon. So we have some students starting, hopefully soon, and that will be our next research. So that's something very exciting, thinking about reducing waste in general, I guess, and reducing a uh, hazard. Uh, in the coming from the from energy storage batteries yeah. great some exciting times ahead yeah. well thank you so much for joining me on the podcast it's been a pleasure to chat and um all the best and stay safe during COVID 19 until we're yeah. out at the end of the other side of the tunnel yeah same for you and i thank you for the for the interview thanks for listening to the aces podcast for more episodes like this one, be sure to subscribe wherever it is you get your podcasts. You can also find more information about ACES on our website, electromaterials.edu.au. There you'll find links to our various social media platforms. And you can also follow me on Twitter, at Samuel Finlay. Until next time, thanks for listening.